Hello, I bought a new drill press a while ago. This is the old one. The new one that I got is way better. It's like twice the size and much nicer to use. The difference is like night and day. So this one's been collecting dust since then, obviously no reason to use it. But I have sort of had a project in mind for this and it's going to be, hopefully, if this works out, a tapping machine, like a power tapping thing. Uh, because I find myself in need of tapping lots of holes along here like that on a very large sheet and it's well I could do it by hand of course uh, but it'd be nicer if you can have something to keep it straight at least to keep it straight but also if it could be powered for you as well that would be nice too uh, and another thing that I'm probably going to end up having to do with this sheet is drill holes as well and again could do that by hand but I want to make the holes a certain depth so this is a 12 millimeter aluminium plate and I only want the hole to go down to 10 millimeters. I don't really want to break through, or 11, 10 or 11. Just, just don't want to break through, right? Uh, so doing that by hand is probably going to be very difficult. So I would like to keep this as a drill as well, but a drill that I could place on something like this, a, a large, heavy piece that I could not put on my other drill press, and drill into uh, the base. So these, these things probably have a proper name, but basically it's this, but shortened a lot, and the drill, when it comes down, is going to go through the floor of that. So we're going to have to do some chopping here. This piece is just going to be thrown away, I think. And I'll cut out that bit there so that we can just go straight through it. Uh, just, just this section here doesn't need to be there. I think I can keep that foot. Hopefully this and that are not inextricably connected to each other because I'm hoping to maybe break those. Oh, actually, no, wait a minute. There's some uh, grub screws in here, so what I'd be better off doing is chopping it at this end. Yeah, and it's also cleaner down here, so I'll keep the bottom part. Um, and in here we've got just the typical situation. It's really nice and clean in here for some reason, all shiny. I wonder how that happened. Aluminium, I guess, doesn't uh, rust or whatever. Uh, so this motor, I'm thinking that's not going to be very good for the power tapping because it's just too fast. So, what are we going to do for a motor? Uh, been playing around with these recently, this motor from a hoverboard. So it's a brushless DC motor, similar to what you'd see on a quadcopter or whatever, but obviously much more powerful, at least high torque. It's not so great in the speed department, because those hoverboards are not supposed to go more than 20 kilometers an hour or something like that, but it has heaps of torque, and I'll just put it down because it's like almost four kilos, it's, uh, it's quite heavy. Uh, so we're gonna have to sort of mount that somehow on there and there's a, uh, looks like about a, f maybe 14 millimeter round there with a flat patch on it. And I can use the mounting clamp that was on the hoverboard that I took this from. I can just cut, cut that away and hopefully mount it on here somewhere. And this will be very nice because I can control the speed of that very precisely and also in both directions. And what I'm thinking is, if I get as far as I'm hoping to with this, I can even have it so that it does maybe two turns and then backs off half a turn or something. How, uh, how it's a good idea to do when you're threading. You don't want to just go all the way in like that. You want to back off a little bit to let the chips uh, get out of the way or whatever. Um, so that could be all programmed so that all you have to do is just sit here and feed it in to start with and then let it run until it's deep enough and then um, we'll have to have a different mode I guess to, to back out so there's going to be some sophisticated control necessary for this but that part I'm actually not too worried about what I'm mostly worried about is how I'm going to mount this on here now this tray piece is nothing in the way of mounting it's just to stop you from getting your fingers into the belt while it's spinning and the motor is actually mounted on this side, excuse the noise there, we're, uh, we're milling some aluminium over there. Um, so it's got this hinge piece and the motor can swing around like that on the hinge and then to make sure that you can adjust it, there's a bit here so that loosens and then the motor can a bit dark there, eh? but it slides on that spring back with the boards. Um, so that's quite a nice system for adjusting the tension on the belt so I can now that I've loosened that I can do that like that 
so that's quite nice, but unfortunately it seems like this plate and that hinge bit are kind of spot welded to the motor casing. So I don't think I'm really going to be able to use that and I'll have to come up with something on my own. Okay, now that I have everything stripped down to the minimum, or at least to, you know, all the parts that I'm going to take off it, I'm starting to change my mind because what I've noticed, I mean change my mind about where the motor should go over here, because what I noticed with this goes on there, um, but if I turn it up that way and I put this on here somehow, if I was able to get that lined up perfectly and attached, it doesn't really need the belt um, because I can control the speed of this quite nicely direct drive, it might actually be better uh, come to think of it, but all I need to do now is stop this bit from turning so it, it's already in the right position it needs to be so all I need to do is maybe use these screws here build up something preferably made from steel to come around here and just resist this torque on there doesn't need to hold it up against gravity doesn't need to hold it in the XY position or anything like that all it does is all it needs to do is resist the torque which makes it actually fairly easy to do it's gonna be quite a lot of torque but that's all it needs to do so I think I might just try and use these screw holes here they're not very deep because these were just the ones that we used to hold on the um, the cover for the belt to stop you from putting your fingers in there um, but I think between the four of them they they should be good enough to do that problem is how how am I going to get that nicely lined up and stuck down is the probably the biggest problem of this whole thing I salvaged this quite nice switch along the way so maybe I could use that for my CNC machine somewhere okay so that's really hard to get out and I've seen people do it you just sort of stand on the sides and then pull with something like that securely gripped to the middle and I was giving that a try and it just sort of felt like I was going to do myself an injury if I persisted with it. It's really stuck in there. It's just the magnets but it's amazing how strong they are. So I decided not to do that and I can tell you it's definitely not a job for sandals. <laughs> and as I'm listening to this noise of the uh, CNC machine droning away over there, it occurred to me that since I have so much aluminium plate I could just make an adapter to go between that and the other piece here and that would solve, solve my other problem of how to get the alignment perfect because if I make one side just big enough to fit over there and the other side just big enough to fit over the front of this then the alignment should be good um, it's not going to be quite so easy on here because it slopes up like that that's really kind of inconvenient so I'd have to make one side to try and fit into there but it's slightly rounded see so yeah and then the only thing that a screw would have to bite into is this little little ridge here which is only like four or five mil wide so that's not really that great either um, that's probably the best I can do and it would solve my alignment issues quite nicely it's also a little bit a little bit tall so from here to where I'd have to bring it down to I'd probably have to have three layers of my six mil plate to do that which is uh, yeah I'll give it a try but I can make it an MDF first uh, and do a, like a test mock-up test fit thing so that's what I'll do I just thought it might be wise to check what sort of performance we can expect from these motors before I commit to a certain type of mounting while these can be made to turn extremely slowly like that I'm just using a iBus input for the hoverboard hack I'll put a link to the this stuff in the description if you want. Um, yeah, it's really nice and smooth and quiet and powerful. So yeah, you can get make them to go very very slow, and they all, are also very very strong. Like, I could probably um, tip this whole vice forwards if I was strong enough to grab hold of this and hold it here, and then put it up to about half throttle. But the problem is you can't really get slow and strong at the same time, at least not that kind of slow, which is what we want. So if I use the trim on my radio to get it to that point, see that's kind of what we want there and I'm not 
not doing anything on the radio there, but at this speed, I can easily stop it. Like I'm not even really trying one finger. So, unfortunately, how fast does it have to go before it's... Nah. So I don't think direct drive is going to work. We're going to have to gear this down so that we can get the speed that we want at the torque that we want, which is kind of a bummer. Oh, sorry, my bad. Um, I was using the wrong mode there. Uh, it's been about a year since I was last playing around with one of these things. Like, I just set a couple of them up to check that they would flash to the program correctly. And then I wanted to try just radio control driving one around the backyard just to see see how they worked. But that was all about a year ago, and for some reason I forgot that the default mode is an, clo is an open loop mode where it just increases the voltage according to whatever you are telling it to, how fast you want it to go. It's not closed loop. Uh, so I changed the mode to a velocity control or speed control, and for most intents and purposes, it kind of works the same until you want to do this. So let's... Hold on. It's very sensitive now on the... Okay. <laughs> So check this out, two clicks of trim, two clicks of trim starts turning, right? And I'm not doing anything here now, but the difference is, it's uh, actually, oh, it's slipping out of the vise unfortunately there, but you can see that that was um, putting out a lot more torque even at that low speed than we saw yesterday. So it's just because I was using the wrong mode. We should be using closed loop mode because these things do have hall encoders, of course. Okay, so here's my two adapter plates that I made out of MDF. It's possible that MDF might be sufficient, so I'll give it a try first, and then if they break, well, make them out of aluminium. So this is 12 millimeters, and this would have to be two. I only have six millimeter aluminium, so I'd have to make two the same of this one. Uh, that's also six there. And this one has a slight bevel in here. I've just filed that off for now um, because the reason we have that is that on the front here there's a sort of a angled bit there and it sits in there quite nicely now due to my filing. So I just crept up on it really slowly with the file so that it just sits in there and it should be nice and centered and it's level. Uh, so before I did the filing, when you put this on, it doesn't sit straight, it sort of wants to slip one way or the other. So that's what I mean by, I just crept up on it. And now, uh, so the filing is just enough to take it so that it sits flat. It should be in the middle, I think. And then this other piece over here has the uh, pulley bit on it. And that's a nice snug fit there too. I was trying this yesterday, and uh, for some reason yesterday the machine wasn't quite square, and I was getting a tiny little bit of an oval here, but then I tried it again today, and it's giving me nice circles, which is a little bit weird, but I prefer it this way. Okay, so then it will go on there, and everything should be nice and centered. Um, unfortunately though, I have a bit of a problem in that I forgot that I don't really have any 4mm screws that are going to be long enough to do that job there. So <laughs> I'm going to have to put this aside for a while because it's Christmas holidays at the moment, all the shops are closed, um, so I'll just have to go and do something else and come back to this later. Let's go a bit faster. Yeah, it's running great. Well, even though I'm not going to be able to finish this today without the longer 4mm bolts, I went ahead and made the holes in here anyway and um, threaded those, tapped those and the ones on the bottom as well, like that. It's really easy to get all these in the right place when you have a proper transfer punch. Um, picked these up a while ago and haven't really used them that much, but just, uh, I th actually I think this is the first time I used them, but man, they're perfect. They just get everything in just the right spot. And these holes here, um, they were about as far in as I could have gone on that side, as we'll see there. Maybe you can see even uh, they were just grazing the wall there, so I think it's probably about as far in as they could go, and they couldn't really be 5mm ones, um, so yeah, I'm just going to have to wait till I get the longer 4mm ones to do that. Anyway, why have I got this sitting on the CNC machine here? 
Well, it's sitting flat there at the moment, but that's only because these bolts here I only have four of them in, and the other two, or the other four, I don't have in, and that's because I kind of forgot that the four millimeter stick out of the head there is going to collide with this. So if I had put all of these bolts in, it would just kind of sit there and rock like that because it wouldn't be able to go all the way down. The reason it goes down with four of them though is because there's actually a difference in height here. The black part is about one millimeter below the silver part and you can see I've marked here where those four bolts are colliding and uh, my first instinct was to um, get a four millimeter counterbore so that I could make that a little bit lower or since it's MDF I could even do that with a sharp knife soft enough just sort of gouge it out a little bit but then I remembered again that I have this large CNC router here now it's taking a while to sink in to my brain the new capabilities I have with this thing um, but anyway I thought I'll just put it on here and raise it up a bit there because the gantry clearance is 16 centimeters and this is about I think it's uh, about 13 at the top of this and I had to lift the spindle up a few pegs on here to get it below to get the cutting head to just sort of poke out that much which is enough and it's not clamped down or anything I'm just going to uh, hold it by hand and I'm not going to write a program for this I'm just going to manually move the head around um, actually you know what I could probably just slide it like this I wouldn't even have to use a computer I think I will um, use the machine to move it because that will make it move at the right speed That should probably do it. There you go. <laughs> Aluminium all over my hand. Okay, so now I have all eight bolts in there. And it sits flat. Whoops, I have to get it in the right place. Yeah, it still needs to be, <laughs> I've got these marks to line it up. Anyway, it's, um, it's all sitting nice and flat now. So I'm thinking I can do something with this old piece of mild steel, probably bolt it on there and chop the back part off and make that part of the vertical or something. Okay, so that gives me a nice base to build a little bit more structure on top of there and it doesn't collide with my pulley wheel. These hoverboard motors are usually mounted in the hoverboard by, uh, in the main chassis there'll be sort of a half cylindrical cutout and then this bit will clamp onto that flat side there like that to stop it from turning and this is conveniently sized kind of about the same as that so I'm just going to mount that well we'll forget about the cylindrical side we're not going to have a <laughs> cylindrical cutout here but the cylindrical side will be just flat against that and then this will clamp, clamp on top and that should stop it from turning just fine Okay, that's that done there. It's a nice solid connection, these things. So the only thing left to do now, for this construction part of it at least, is to put a vertical piece in here. Okay, I have this just grazing the top of there. It's nicely trimmed. 
And this time when I weld this joint, I'm not going to put my clamp here like I did just before, because if I do that, this side's going to lift up a tiny bit. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, does it? Maybe it doesn't. I think it might. So I'm going to hold it down, just lightly clamp it on this part, because that's where I want to be like concentric to everything else. So it's just clamped a little bit there, and it turned out perfect actually. Um, it's only just touching one little bit there, so I can easily build weld across there, but the touching of this is not really interfering with any alignment, so that's just perfect. Okay, so it's mostly welded into place, at least good enough. Uh, I'm going to take it off and weld in that little bit there that I can't reach as it is. Um, so one thing I hadn't considered is how easy it would be to get this motor in and out now that this structure is holding it from the top and the bottom at the same time. And fortunately it's not going to be too hard. Um, the motor itself doesn't really have enough room to lift out by itself like that. Um, but to get the motor out you're going to have to undo all of these 10 screws around the side here anyway. And when you do that the ring comes with it so you can get it out like that. Okay so that's done and I think it turned out alright. Uh, if you notice that it's welded crooked like that supposed to be because uh, when you put that bottom one straight this has to be the center of the axis as you look down at it like that so this one has to be quite a bit crooked and I just put this one like halfway in between to stagger it so that the welds would like have as much contact as possible or the welds contact of the welds would be about the same in at the top and the bottom anyway um, yeah so that's pretty much done I'll put some paint on that and now we've got to go and figure out the uh, programming side of it don't we oh, actually there's a couple more things I have to do here one is to chop that shorter and the other is to take the spring out of here because I don't think that's going to be desirable we we just sort of want to have it moving and it's going to move with gravity unfortunately It'd be nice if we could counterweight it so it just sort of stayed where we put it but anyway uh, the spring definitely has to go and I'm sure that somebody's already writing a comment to tell me that a drill press chuck is not ideal for doing this because it doesn't have these square bits in here like you would normally have for a, a tap holder. Um, so that the, these taps, at the top of the tap, there's like a square bit that fits into there so you can get a really good torque on it while you're twisting. And I don't know, probably might have to do something about this, but I want to try it first because... I'm only doing aluminium and I'm only going up to M8, this is the largest one that I'll be using here. Um, so hopefully with this just plain old drill bit arbor or uh, chuck, yeah it's a chuck isn't it? Hopefully it'll get through aluminium with that size tap okay. So I'm just putting that one in there and I'm judging how, how high I want to have this before I chop it off. I have a feeling this is going to spring out and something's going to fly out so let's do it carefully. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, well, that wasn't too violent. I thought that maybe if I just sprung this a little less tightly, I could get the result that I was talking about before, so just to counteract gravity. But unfortunately, all that does is it just gives it a new target point. So instead of trying to go all the way up, it tries to sit in the middle now. If I put it there, it goes up to the middle. If I put it at the top, it goes to the middle as well. So it's not really... <laughs> now it just wants to go here. It's not really what I wanted. tiny. <laughs> so with this M8 in there it's got about eight millimeters of clearance and this doesn't seem like much but the smaller bit, um, taps like this one like M4 is probably the smallest I'd use with it and uh, these are shorter so I don't want them to be starting too far up because then this needs to wind down more and this uh, thing's not very good the bearings are like cheapy ones, or I don't know exactly what the problem is, but the further down, the further down you let it go like that, uh, the more wobbly it gets. So I want to kind of use it at the top of this range as much as possible. And if I do use larger ones that need to have more clearance, uh, you can just like, put some MDF or whatever under the base of it there, and you can easily get higher if you want to. Okay, I still don't have all the bolts I need, but I thought I'd put it together here with the motor on just to have a check and see how things are going at this point. 
and it's all right at low speed. It gets a bit wobbly at high speed. This is about a quarter speed probably here. Uh, so when I put it up to high speed, I actually have to hold hold this bit at the top so that it doesn't <laughs> fall fall off. But full speed looks like this. So it's a bit wobbly. And other direction. That's not great, but it doesn't worry me too much because mainly tapping is what I wanted to use this for. And at the slow speed, it's fine. And uh, yeah, even without the bolts there, I I can't stop it by holding here. And I was, at first I was puzzled, like why is there so much torque, even though this is not held together? Because I thought this would slip around. But then it occurred to me that the the front of the hoverboard motor, where I uh, made those little recesses for the bolt heads. As the bolts turn, they're going to get stuck on the sides of those recesses, and then we get quite a lot of torque. Oh yeah, and this is another problem that's now becoming more annoying, is that the, the dead zone doesn't really exist. It wasn't apparent when you're in the voltage setting, so now we're doing the closed loop speed target. When you're in the voltage setting, as, as long as the voltage goes below a certain point, the motor's not going to move. But what's happening now is it thinks it's being commanded to move a tiny little bit, just because the potentiometer in here isn't perfectly centered and you can sort of twiddle with it a bit to get it to stop but obviously this is not ideal so um, when I make my actual control system for this I'm going to have to make sure that instead of using PWM or PPM or anything like that I'm going to have to use a serial input like IBUS which is what I'm going to do so that I can give it a, a, an actual number instead of just a timing based number so we'll be able to fix that when we do the real control. And another thing I noticed now that it's set up like this is that I can just get it to stop. When you turn it, because it has that velocity target from the closed loop, it, it resists you turning it and it actually tries to come back to that position, more or less. It doesn't quite perfectly get there. And it would also be nice if we could, <coughs> if we could turn this braking off somehow. There's probably a way to do that. I don't think I'll bother with that really, but it might be convenient sometimes to be able to just turn it by hand to maybe retract if it's got a bit stuck and you just want to do it carefully manually instead of relying on the motor to do it. I know this is hardly a complete product yet, but I just wanted to try tapping a M8 hole through this 6mm aluminium. Okay, let's start with this. And that vise is not fixed there, so it's going to move around. It won't move far. There we go. Uh, something slipping. Oh. Uh. Okay, so now this is slipping. Yeah. Oh well, that's not going to work. Looks like we do need those bolts there after all, huh? Well, this is not such good news. I decided to turn the rest of it by hand, just by turning the motor, and. Now we can see that the chuck is also slipping on the tap. Uh, really did not want to see that. So that is annoying and it's not even that much uh, not much not even that much force that I'm putting into it. Oh, it retracts quite nicely at least. Okay, so I did another shopping trip today and I got the longer M4 bolts that I needed to make the adapter plate grip properly and I set that all up and I took this out to the garage to connect it all up again very, very excited about how it was all going to suddenly work and then I spent the next hour killing not one but two of these hoverboard controllers fortunately I have a third um, so the problem with the first one was that this is the one that I set up a year ago and I put it into a box with a bunch of other stuff and I just kind of threw stuff in on top of it uh, and some of that stuff was little screws and bolts and somehow uh, for the past week there was a little screw lodged in there between those caps and I didn't notice it. I did notice that this was behaving a little bit strangely, like quite often you turn the power button on and nothing would happen and then other times it would work and then today when I was setting it up it started turning itself on and I thought that's extremely strange and then I saw a little bit of a spark down here and basically that was the end of that and I'm not exactly sure what died there but I think it's probably the micro microcontroller itself. Oh actually that's the second one I killed. So that's the first one I killed there. Then the second one here, um, so I took this out of another hoverboard and see that red pin header there? 
with the four pins on it. I soldered that on to connect my um, STM32 like software debug, like a dongle thingy for flashing. And I did that by obviously taking it off the board and soldering in from the back here. And as I was doing that, the second pin from the bottom, just as I started to solder it, there was a huge spark. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and no, I didn't have the battery connected or anything. It was just like this. And the only thing that was touching it was the tip of the soldering iron and probably the solder itself as I was poking it in. But there was no power. But um, these things have large caps here and the problem is that even after you disconnect it from the power, there's still like 40 volts or something at some times across these bits here. So this is just a huge bank of capacitance. So I thought I might just mention this. This video is not supposed to be about hoverboard controllers. Um, I wasn't really going to talk about these at all actually because there's so much other information and videos and stuff on YouTube about them. But I have not seen this mentioned elsewhere so I will just mention it. This is a third one that I also soldered those pins on again. But before I did that, I used a little resistor to touch across here and I kept an eye on the voltage. You can just use a voltmeter on there to see what the voltage is, see? 36 volts. There's no battery anywhere here. And it's been like that for about 10 minutes. So it can stay high voltage there for quite a long time. And there's enough energy in those caps to kill the microcontroller, obviously. Um, but what I did this time before doing my soldering was, yeah, just put a resistor on there, keep an eye on the voltage. When it goes to about 1 or 2 volts, then just um, touch across it with a screwdriver to get it to zero. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to touch across it with a screwdriver straight away, because you still get a big spark. It's probably not going to go through the microcontroller, but I just don't like big sparks, you know? Anyway, so we're back up and running with this one. Oh, it's going no problem. I wonder why... Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe last time I just didn't have this chuck tightened up very well. Because I took it out and put it back in and tightened it again. And uh, discovered that one of my... <laughs> the weak point in my design is that now it's hard to get this in here because there's no space. Sort of have to do it over there. That's not too bad. But that's what I was saying about it might be annoying that now you can't grab this by hand and turn it because it's it's braked. So to turn it conveniently I'd have to turn it off. Now I can put it wherever I like and my key can go in a more or less convenient place. Um, but yeah, torque was fine. The adapter plate seems to be perfectly fine. Looks like we tapped the hole okay. One issue I did discover though was um, after I put these bolts in here so that now the MDF and the motor are securely connected to each other, we're getting quite a bit of wobble in the... Um, well, at speed we do anyway. I don't know if you can see that too well. If you look at the edge of the edge of the platform that's sitting on there, see it's sort of bobbing up and down. So it wasn't doing that until I tightened the motor and the MDF together. But it's not bad, and it's only going to be an issue at speed. Oh yeah. Uh, once you get over a certain speed, it's sort of. <laughs> The resonance sort of cancels out a little bit and it's not, not as bad as it is at half speed. Oh, you can still do drilling like that. That works, there we go. So it's a decently tapped hole with no elbow grease required. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm 
drill's no problem too. So I've sorted out how I'm going to control this thing and I think I'll just show you a little bit of that and then finish the video because it's getting quite long. And we've pretty much answered the main question, at least for me, which was is this hoverboard motor even feasible and should we use it direct drive or belt drive or something like that? And I think we've answered that, so there's not really a whole lot more information to be gained by watching me set this up. Uh, it should be a foregone conclusion that iForce 2D is capable of um, setting up something to make this work. But I'm going to use the SBUS mixer, so if people watching are interested in SBUS mixer, you might find the rest of this video interesting. Otherwise, if you just want to see this machine working, um, keep an eye out for my upcoming another DIY CNC router build video series that's ongoing at the moment. I think I just uploaded part 7, so part 8 is where this machine will start to show up. Anyway, for the rest of us who are still watching, the way I want to control this machine is I want to have a two-position switch like this, and that's going to decide whether I want to do drilling or tapping. And then I have a three-position switch, and this is going to be my direction, so one way is going to be to advance or go into the material, the other direction is going to be to retreat or pull out of the material, and then in the middle we're going to do nothing. And then I'm going to have two dials for controlling the speed. One is the speed when we're drilling. That's pretty much just going to be full speed all the time, I think. And the other one is the speed when we're tapping, which is pretty much going to be about one-third speed. And then when we're tapping, I want to have it so that it automatically goes in for, say, two or three revolutions, and then it backs off by half a revolution or something like that. And these two are going to be to control that. So one is the duration and one is the percentage of how much is in and how much is out. So this one here will be, um, we don't have a stepper motor unfortunately. If we had a stepper motor we could say explicitly I want you to do two turns and then a half a turn back. But since we don't have a stepper motor we're just going to have to uh, use time, uh, seconds for example. So uh, let's say we want to go forward for three seconds and then back for one second then this dial would set the total time to be four seconds for that for that cycle and then within that cycle we want to say with this other dial what percentage of the time should be spent going forward and backwards so if I put this halfway like that it would be two seconds forward two seconds backwards most likely I'm going to put that to about 10 to 15 percent or something like that so the way these hoverboard motors are controlled, at least with the uh, the setup that I'm using, the hoverboard hack, again I'll put a link in the description to that, um, it works by the same kind of way that a servo is controlled. So in a servo you give it a signal between 1000 and 2000 microseconds, and that's what the servo PWM output does. And I have actually a servo connected to pin 17 of my SBUS mixer at the moment, and this um, value here, 0 0.5, most numbers in the SBUS mixer system work from 0 to 1. Um, so 0 will be all the way left or all the way low, and 1 will be all the way high, for example. And by the way, if you're watching this in the future, uh, this thing might not be called SBUS mixer. I'm really, I really hate that name, but I still can't think of anything better for the time being. So if we just look over on my camera here, we'll see um, this is a servo. It's over all the way over in one position at the moment because I forgot to upload that before I started, but there we go. So what I just did there is I uploaded this value 0.5 and that's going to actually be halfway between here. So 1500 microseconds is what that servo just did there. And obviously that's not very convenient if you want to test things in real time because you have to keep going upload like this. But I can do 0 0.75 or whatever and upload that. Um, so what I'd rather do is this tweak number thing which we'll see a lot of in the next little bit that's why I wanted to explain this here but I can connect that to there and then I can use this slider to change that value in real time uh, unfortunately it has taken the value that was there when I connected so my low is going to be 0 0.25 my high is going to be 1.25 if I type a number in here explicitly it will then become that number will become in the middle of my range. So now I've got it from 0 to 1. And you can see, hopefully, you can see in the bottom there, it's a little bit small probably on your screen, but the servo is moving from left to right as I do that. Now let me just put it back in the middle here. And I'll zoom out a bit. Now the way that we want to control the hoverboard motor, as I mentioned earlier, we don't really want to use PWM because that relies on timing and you get a little bit of jitter and it's hard to send a perfect zero or in this case a perfect 0 0.5 like we want it to be 0 0.5 to stop it otherwise 
if we get a value like this, 0 0.500 something something, it's going to move very, very slowly, which is not ideal in this case, especially if we're trying to change the drill or the tap bit or anything like that. Um, so what I'm using here is a serial RC output, which is in this case IBUS, uh, and that's set up over here in, in a different section, um, so that, that there dictates whether it's going to be IBUS or SBUS. Uh, let's just go back to that. And this is also going to output 0 0.5, and field 1 is aileron probably, I'm not sure what it, what it is, but in this case it just controls the speed of the hoverboard. Um, so we can also connect that to our tweak number, and I think if everything works now, yeah, we can see that 0 0.5 will stop the motor. And if I can't get it, see what I mean? If I can't get it exactly to 0 0.5, it moves a little bit like that. That's why you have to use IBUS for this instead of PWM or PPM or something that's timing based. Anyway, all the way over there, it's full speed that direction. And then all the way over there is full speed in that direction. You can see the servo is using the same um, same signal as well. So let me just put that back to there. All right. So now that I've um, hopefully pulled you in with this rather simple discussion, what I'm going to do is disconnect this here and connect it to my actual program, which is this one. Now, don't worry too much about this. Um, I don't think I'll really explain it, but I did just want to show you the fact that we have these tweak number things all over the place, and you should recognize what they mean now too. So we have a duration dial, and we have a direction switch, which is a three-position switch that's either going to be advanced, retract, or nothing. Actually, the nothing should be in the middle because the middle position does nothing. That's why it's doing nothing right now. Um, and then we have some other ones, so we have the the reverse percentage, and then we have the mode switch, so this is a two position switch for drilling or tapping, and then down here we have our two speed dials, and drill speed probably can go faster, and I think I had to set up what looked, uh, what seemed just right. So what I'm using these for here is a stand-in for a analog input. So if I go to nodes here, in the future what I'll actually be doing is I'll be replacing these drill speed, for example, my drill speed dial is going to be disconnected from there and this will have a, a physical pin with one of those dials connected to it. Uh, not doing that just yet, so let me put it back. But that's that's what I'm going to do in the future, but for the time being, while I'm just sitting here at my computer and I don't have any of my hardware connected ready to try, this is a great way to do like a virtual dial. Uh, so let's see if this uh, is going to work. It might not, it might need to be uploaded. Let's see what I can get here, direction switch. Okay, so I have to upload this one more time because I changed it before. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let me just reacquaint myself. I was doing this yesterday. Um, so in the low position, so anything anything less than halfway on this two position switch input, when I do my dialing, my direction forward, if this goes over, and you can see I've got my tests here, if it's greater than 7, 0 0.75 or less than 0 0.25. So if this one goes over 0 0.75 it's considered that the switch is in the forward position for direction and we get full speed forward in that direction otherwise if it's in the middle region we get nothing and full speed backward I can't think of a situation when I'd ever use drill full speed backward but I mean I just put it in there anyway and then if we change my mode switch to tapping mode which is going to be all the way over there and then we do my direction switch again uh, now we'll see that it's much slower because it's using a separate speed setting from one of those other dials. And I think it's, uh, I forget how many seconds that is there, but you can see it's going forward for a while in one direction, then it stops and goes just a little bit back like that. And it's doing that automatically. So my thinking is that I'll just sit there and watch it until it gets either all the way through, depending on what I'm doing, or 
until it gets to a point. Uh, for example, what I'm trying to do probably tomorrow, I want to tap holes only down to about 10 or 11 millimeters and then I want to stop it. Uh, and then in the other direction, it just goes all the way without reversing at all, just just all the way in one direction. Um, so the other dials there, I don't think we'll need to play with those, but basically we have a duration. Oh yeah, let's let's play with that a little bit. So we'll go forward tapping, and then I'll just reduce my duration a lot all the way down here. So you can see that cycle is much quicker. It doesn't get to go forward much, and then it does a little back. And we'll just increase that a bit again. I don't know if this is going to be practical, by the way. That's why I thought I might have these dials on there so I can change it and play around. Um, the other thing that's quite useful with these tweak nodes that I'm using is that I might not want to have a dial, but I still want to sit here and figure out what kind of a number I might want to use. Like what, I can't remember what I had before, but it was pretty good. So these tweaks are just good for tweaking things. Funny that. Uh, so my tap speed is here. It's at quarter speed roughly. We can make it tap quicker. Don't think we... Oh, actually, it might not be too bad, you know. See, these, this is what we don't know. If this was going through a 6mm aluminum plate, that speed might be just fine. But through the 12mm plate might be a bit might be a bit fast. Also depends what size of um, thread that you're tapping. And then the drill speed, oh, we saw that before. And then the tap reverse percentage. Uh, so if we put this to halfway, it's going to be equal in both directions. Anyway, I think you get the idea. And anybody who's still watching this video, well done. Um, yeah, so like I say, I'll put all this together. And this will probably be showing up in part 8 of my another DIY CNC router series. Whenever that comes out, we don't know. But I thought I might just upload this a little bit earlier rather than later so that people have something to watch over the new year while they're uh, relaxing, holidays and stuff. Anyway, that's all for me from now. Happy New Year and uh, see you next time.